This is Space Time, Series 26, Episode 2. Coming up on Space Time, where did the first quasars come from? Why the Southern Hemisphere is so much stormier than the North? And Leo Lab's new radar station in Western Australia. All that and more coming up on Space Time. Welcome to Space Time with Stuart Gary. New computer simulations reported in the current issue of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine suggested the universe's first quasars probably originated from supermassive black holes formed directly out of the collapse of massive clouds of gas. Quasars are powerful beams of matter and energy shooting out from a black hole's accretion disk at close to the speed of light. They're generated by material on the accretion disk heating up through friction and being torn apart at the subatomic level by the black hole's powerful gravitational forces, in the process releasing massive amounts of energy. Now, While most of this material will eventually be consumed by the black hole, some of it is captured by powerful magnetic fields before reaching the black hole's event horizon. It's then fired out into space perpendicular to the black hole's secretion disk, forming a bright beam, so powerful it can be seen across on the other side of the universe. Spectral analysis shows that these quasars can be over 13 billion years old, making them some of the earliest, oldest and most distant objects ever seen. It would take a supermassive black hole a billion times the mass of our sun to generate that much power. And that raises the question... How can something so big and so powerful have already been in existence so early in the history of the universe? To try and resolve the problem, Daniel Whelan from the University of Portsmouth and colleagues developed new computer simulations of the very early universe, when it was just 100 million years old. They followed the growth of a small foaming sea of matter being fed by torrents of inflowing gas. And within the sea, they observed a clump take shape then another, and another. But the influence of the inflowing gas was preventing the clumps from collapsing into stars, instead allowing them to continue growing until they were tens of thousands of solar masses in size. Their findings, reported in the journal Nature, suggest that these massive clumps would eventually compress into the first massive stars, living for maybe 2 billion years before collapsing to form black holes between 30 and 40,000 solar masses each, something unheard of in today's universe. But the intense turbulence seen in this model still prevented some of these clumps from ever forming into stars. Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, says some of these massive clouds of gas, these clumps, would have instead collapsed directly into black holes, providing the power needed to drive these first ancient quasars. Well, quasars, it's it's a funny word, Q-U-A-S-A-R, and it stands for quasi-stellar object, because when they were first spotted by big professional telescopes, they just looked a bit like stars. Right? But it was soon realised when we worked out, when astronomers worked out what their red shifts are, that they couldn't possibly be stars because they're so far away and so far back in time that uh, at those distances, individual stars would be simply invisible. But these things, to be that bright, that far away and that far back in time, must have been very, very, very bright. What on, well, I was going to say what on Earth, but what in space could um, possibly produce that amount of energy in a, in a con- what seemed to be a fairly condensed area, like a, a small area? a small volume back then in the, the, the distant reaches of, of time, you know, back towards the Big Bang. So they called them quasars, and they, they're obviously around in the early universe. Couldn't be stars, far too big and bright for that. So the consensus formed was that the only thing known that could produce this kind of energy was black holes. Now, black holes themselves don't give off uh, that kind of energy, but any gas and stuff that is swirling around near them, as it speeds up, it will give off a lot of light, and that's what we would be seeing in the form of these quasars. But to get that sort of amount of energy, these black holes would have to be super-duper big, not the sort of small black holes you get when an individual star goes bang at the end of its life and its its core compresses down into a tiny thing. These would have to be black holes that weigh thousands, at least thousands of times uh, the mass of our sun. So there are big, huge black holes. So scientists have now done some computer simulations looking at what would have happened to the gas clouds that they think populated the early universe. And their calculations have shown that clumps would form within these clouds 
But instead of these clumps going on to form individual stars, the clumps sort of joined together and they just kept growing and growing, getting bigger and bigger like Topsy. And when they became big enough, some of these clumps joined up and, and then their combined mass made them gravitationally collapse into very big black holes. This is what was happening in this computer simulation, right? So there all of a sudden you've got big black holes, very big black holes, and there would still be remnant gas going around. So that gas would be sort of sucked in towards the black holes, start swirling around, and the faster the gas goes, the more light it gives off. And bingo, you've got a quasar, and lots of quasars. They, their calculations show that you would get lots of quasars. And this is really early on in the age of the universe, not long after the Big Bang in, in sort of space terms. So this could explain why you would have quasars, which are thought to be powered by big black holes, fairly early on. It would be these big gas clouds forming individual clumps, and the clumps just joining together and eventually collapsing from their own gravity and becoming big black holes. So interesting stuff. You know, with the James Webb Space Telescope up there now, with its, with its view optimized for infrared, which is going to be brilliant for looking back through the uh, age of the universe, back towards the Big Bang, we should start to get some really good imagery and data of what was going on there better than we've had so far. So we may be able to confirm or refute this hypothesis from this computer simulation. So again, we're living in a really exciting time. We've got the technology out there and hats off to the people who make these telescopes, design the things and run the missions because it's, it's just going to answer these, these questions. So these scientists have done computer simulations, calculations of what might happen. The telescope out there, James Webb, is going to show us what did happen. For the last 50 years, one of the big debates in astronomy has been which came first, the supermassive black hole at the centre of a galaxy or the galaxy. And it sounds like this computer simulation has reached a conclusion. Yeah, yeah. Well, <clears throat> if it's correct and um, if it can be verified, then yeah, maybe the black holes were the sort of the seeds or the nucleus that then gathered in material around, which then formed uh, this swirl galaxy, these beautiful galaxies that we see. So um, as, as I say, we, the James Webb Space Telescope is going to be able to show us these things, at least in some detail. So uh, we'll be able to verify this particular, uh, verify or refute this particular idea or any of the other ideas that have been proposed over the years. So it's exciting time. Yeah, well, we just had the announcement of the discovery of Glass Z12, which is uh, possibly the earliest fully formed galaxy ever seen, just 300 million years after the Big Bang, which means the stars would have started forming just 100 million years after the Big Bang, which means the cosmic dark ages were really short. They only lasted 100 million years before the epoch of reionization. Yeah, so the evidence is sort of accumulating, you might say, that things got going really quickly in the early part of the universe. And, and, and this is the great thing about science is that, you know, we, we had, for all these years, we've had a certain amount of data, we've had certain observations, and we couldn't get anything better. So people have had to form hypotheses based on that. But, you know, we get more data, we get more observations, bigger and better telescopes that show us more clearly what exactly was happening. And that way you can sort of drop off the hypotheses that don't match it. And, uh, and the hypotheses that do match, well, one of them may end up being right. It's, it's a sort of a, uh, that's the process of scientific discovery. Really. That's Jonathan Alley, the editor of Australian Sky and Telescope magazine. And this is Space Time. Still to come, why the Southern Hemisphere is so much stormier than the North, and Leo Lab's new Western Australian radar station, a sort of traffic control centre for satellites. All that and more still to come on Space Time. For centuries, sailors who have been all over the world knew that the most fearsome storms of all lay in wait in the Southern Hemisphere. In fact, one passenger on an 1849 voyage around the tip of South America wrote how the waves ran mountain high and threatened to overwhelm the ship at every roll. Many years later, scientists poring over satellite data have now finally put the numbers behind the sailors' stories together, finding that the Southern Hemisphere is indeed far stormier than the Northern Hemisphere, by about 24% in fact, but still no one knew why. Now a new study led by University of Chicago climate scientist Tiffany Shaw lays out the first concrete explanation for this phenomenon. Shaw and colleagues found two major culprits, ocean circulation and the large mountain ranges in the Northern Hemisphere. The studies also found that this storminess asymmetry has actually increased since the beginning of the satellite era in the 1980s. And they say the increase is quantitatively consistent with climate change forecasts from physics-based models. 
For a long time, scientists did know much about weather in the Southern Hemisphere. That's because most of the ways they observed weather was land-based and the Southern Hemisphere has an awful lot more ocean than the Northern Hemisphere and consequently far less land. But with the advent of satellite-based global observing in the 1980s, scientists could finally quantify how extreme the difference was. It turns out the Southern Hemisphere has a far stronger jet stream and more intense weather events. Lots of ideas have been circulated about why, but no one's actually established a definitive explanation for this asymmetry. The study's authors brought together multiple lines of evidence from observations, theory and physics-based simulations of Earth's climate and they developed new climate models to test various hypotheses. They then began removing different variables one at a time and quantified each one's impact on storminess. The first of the variables they tested was topography. After all, large mountain ranges disrupt airflow in a way that reduces storms and there are far more mountain ranges in the Northern Hemisphere. Indeed, when they flattened every mountain on Earth in their simulations, about half the difference in storminess between the two hemispheres disappeared. But the other variable had to do with ocean circulation. Water moves around the globe like a really slow but very powerful conveyor belt. It sinks in the Arctic, travels along the bottom of the ocean, rises near Antarctica and then flows up near the surface, carrying energy from the sun with it and this creates an energy difference between the two hemispheres. When scientists tried to eliminate this conveyor belt, they saw the other half of the storminess suddenly disappear. Having answered the fundamental question regarding why the southern hemisphere is stormier than the northern hemisphere, the authors moved on to examine how storminess has changed since scientists have been able to track it. They found that looking over the past decades of observations, the storminess asymmetries increased during the satellite era beginning the 1980s. That is, the southern hemisphere is getting even more stormy, while any change on the average in the northern hemisphere has been fairly negligible. They found the southern hemisphere storminess changes were connected to changes in the ocean. There was a similar ocean influence occurring in the Northern Hemisphere, but its effect was being cancelled by the absorption of sunlight in the Northern Hemisphere due to the loss of sea ice and snow. The authors found that models used to forecast climate change as part of the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change Assessment Report were showing the same signals, increasing storminess in the Southern Hemisphere, but negligible changes in the Northern, which serves as an important independent check on the accuracy of these models. This is climate change. And this is space time. Still to come, Leo Lab's new Western Australian radar station, and later in the science report, a new computer program designed to determine whether a video is real or deep fake. All that and more still to come on space time. Silicon Valley-based orbital radar mapping startup Leo Labs has completed construction of their sixth and newest space radar facility near Coley in southern Western Australia. The Leo Labs network is used to monitor low Earth orbit, a region of space which has become increasingly crowded in recent years. The company's new facility, named WASA, the Western Australian Space Radar, will go online in the next few weeks, operating as Leo Labs' ninth and tenth space radars. Construction of the new radar facilities only began last April and they'll form an important part of Leo Lab's integrated global network. The new WASA facilities follow the recent addition in August of another new site in the Azores. The new Coley facility will join Leo Lab's Kiwi Space Radar Complex on New Zealand's South Island to undertake a significant portion of the Southern Hemisphere's space surveillance operations. Combining data from the two facilities will allow far more accurate tracking of spacecraft and debris in low Earth orbit, acting as a sort of satellite air traffic control centre. So the industry is going through an inflection point that you rarely see. Three years ago, there were 800 satellites operating in LEO. Now there are close to 4,000 satellites operating there. And in the next few years, it'll be close to 50,000 satellites. So the traffic's ramping up dramatically. Launches are more frequent and there's an underpinning of uh, lack of regulatory rules. It's still sort of the wild, wild west out there. So what that means is, as companies are launching all these new satellites, they need infrastructure and services to ensure that their businesses are safe, their satellites are safe, and they're operating effectively and responsibly. 
The problem that Leo Labs is solving is tracking and knowing where everything is in space that's orbiting the Earth so that we can allow greater use of space, greater um, profits to be had in space by the various companies moving into space, and greater security in space. Leo Labs is the only company that's pursuing the end-to-end -end solution. We start by generating the data by running this worldwide network of radars located in the northern and the southern hemisphere. Uh, we then run many layers of software, so digital signal processing, orbit determination, uh, conjunction alerting, and a whole set of AI ML tools, and that generates real-time information. We have built and we operate a modern space infrastructure stack that consists of phased array radars on the ground, looking up into space, tracking thousands of objects in low Earth orbit every hour. So that includes live satellites that are maneuvering, uh, dead satellites that have been up there for decades, uh, old tumbling rocket bodies that have been around for a long time, and thousands of pieces of space junk. Getting hit by something is still really bad. Something you know as small as two centimeters across. Because remember that the, those objects can be moving relative to you up to 14, 15 kilometers per second. So that's in the range of 30, 35,000 miles per hour. So even getting hit by something as small as two centimeters across will totally ruin your day and perhaps the day of your business or the year of your business. If you have a primary object and a secondary object that are on risk of collision, we are running algorithms that would tell us where they might meet in space and at what time. And so with that, we create reports that we can then tell the customers, hey, here's what's happening. And they can actually take action uh, to avoid, of course, a space um, collision or something like that happening. We're layering on top of that decades of experience in space industry to be able to not only bring the community the best content through these radar measurements, but the best context perspective of what does this data really mean for the immediate space safety, but also long-term space sustainability. We have teams located around the world. We have a team in the US, we have a team in Australia, and a team in Japan. And every single day, they are handing off operations between time zones so that we maintain a continuous watch over space. Essentially, you can think of it as like a living map of space. The trajectories and coordinates of all the objects out up there, the satellites, the debris, updating continuously every second throughout the day. Leo Lab serves 60% of all the active satellites in low Earth orbit. We're putting out over 400 million conjunction data messages every single month, and we've supported the launch of over half of all the active satellites in LEO, locating those satellites within hours after they reach orbit to help the operators move them safely into full operations. LEO's going through a once-in-a-generation transformation. It used to be all about exploration and militaries. This new space race is all commercial. Commercial innovation is driving the large numbers of satellites, it's driving the new uh, human space flight, and it's connecting space back down to the ground in a way that's never been seen before. We are rapidly expanding our radar network. So we have radars located in the US, in Alaska and Texas, a radar site in New Zealand, in Costa Rica, in the Azores, uh, as well as West Australia and another undisclosed location. Over the next few years, we plan quite a large number of new radars that will give us worldwide coverage of areas above the Earth, which is missing today. Among the other things that we've done that are really notable are that we've improved the sensitivity of our radar so that we can track smaller and smaller objects. Objects smaller than anybody else in the world is tracking. And we've built the systems that allow that data to be served up to customers so that they can be protected from these smaller objects, which are out there, but which nobody else is tracking. Having flown in space, I know that the greatest danger to astronauts in space in the long term is space debris. And we're the only company, the only organization that's actively working to reduce that risk in a meaningful manner. And that's because we're working to build the tracking network that will protect the astronauts from objects which are too small to be tracked by other networks. As we build out our global network and we, and we mature our uh, discovery of small, lethal, non-trackable debris, what we're really going to be able to do is provide services that will enable better design, better manufacture, better deployment, better operations, 
and more reasonable retirement process so that whole life cycle will really bring much more benefit to the industry than just keeping you safe for that one conjunction event. When you see the, the ultimate outcome, which is, you know, we're actually helping keep space safe, that is a reward that it's just hard to describe. It, it, it's so, it feels good to work here and it feels good to work with a team that connects well with each other because I feel like teamwork is what makes it a success. Um, and I think that's a very strength of Leo Labs. This is Space Time. And that's the show for now. Space Time is available every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday through Apple Podcasts, iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Pocket Casts, Spotify, Acast, Amazon Music, Bytes.com, SoundCloud, YouTube, your favorite podcast download provider, and from SpaceTimeWithStuartGary.com. Space Time's also broadcast through the National Science Foundation on Science Zone Radio and on both iHeartRadio and TuneIn Radio. And you can help to support our show by visiting the Spacetime store for a range of promotional merchandising goodies. Or by becoming a Spacetime patron, which gives you access to triple episode commercial free versions of the show, as well as lots of bonus audio content which doesn't go to air, access to our exclusive Facebook group and other rewards. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.com for full details. And if you want more space time, please check out our blog where you'll find all the stuff we couldn't fit in the show, as well as heaps of images, news stories, loads of videos, and things on the web I find interesting or amusing. Just go to spacetimewithstuartgary.tumblr.com. That's all one word, and that's Tumblr without the E. You can also follow us through at Stuart Gary on Twitter, at Spacetime with Stuart Gary on Instagram, through our Space Time YouTube channel. And on Facebook, just go to facebook.com forward slash Space Time with Stuart Gary. And Space Time is brought to you in collaboration with Australian Sky and Telescope magazine, your window on the universe. You've been listening to Space Time with Stuart Gary. This has been another quality podcast production from Bytes.com.